I went in 1977 to um, Asia and Europe for an overland trip, hitchhiking, bus, etc., etc. The Reserve Bank of India effectively decided how much you could spend on a hotel, how much you could spend on your meals, and, how, and it was broken up in that manner. <coughs> and the amount that you got depended on your designation in the company. And there was a full table. Okay, which said that if you are the managing director of a company with a size larger than so and so much, then you got $150 if you went to Europe or America, and $130 if you went to the Middle East, and $110 if you went to uh, East Asia, and so much if you went to Russia, and so much for entertainment and so much for transport. Even to get this, you had to apply for what was called a P form. If I traveled abroad with a camera, even a beat up old second hand camera, I had to get the customs authorities to enter the fact that I was carrying a camera. Because otherwise when I came back, the presumption would be that I was smuggling a camera back in. So I'll show you this passport from the 70s. What the regulations meant in terms of foreign travel. That you were allowed $100 for a private trip, and even that $100 was entered in your passport. But even so, you couldn't do it in $100. That meant 90% of people who were traveling overseas from India were breaking the law the moment they decided to go. Because they had to find some way of arranging those funds overseas. Whether through the Hawala route or through some a relative or whatever, some arrangement to pay people back for the money that they were spending overseas. You could travel on business and you got a business allowance. So when I traveled to um, Paris and then back, and my uh, ambition was to travel on $10 a day, and I actually managed on less than $10 a day. Nevertheless, if you're talking about it was something in the region of eight weeks, so even so, you're talking about 50 plus days, and even at $10 a day, you're talking about $500. But I was allowed $100 as um, foreign exchange allowance for a personal trip. And you got $8, which is supposed to cover the cost of coffee and a telephone call and a bus journey into town when you reach the other end. I mean, this is the kind, this is the kind of stuff people, Babu spent their tax-paid uh, hours of work thinking about it. $8, somebody came up with this magnanimous number for this allowance. So clearly this was not enough. So what did I do? I bought $100 in the black market from some tourist in Champat. And I went to Mohan Singh place, which is where all these kind of trades used to take place. You could buy old jeans, you know, even old jeans had a premium because you could, there were no jeans in India, okay. And I bought a sleeping bag, which was an unknown commodity over here. So I bought a sleeping bag for a couple of hundred rupees, which was torn and you know battered, but I needed a sleeping bag. And I bought a hundred dollars at a premium of premiums used to run like 30, 40 percent. So from my pocket money, I bought a hundred dollars in the black market. How to take it out? So I took that hundred dollar bill and I folded it in four bits. So it became a narrow strip. I opened up my film reel, which I was carrying abroad, and cut it in half. And I re-threaded it back onto the cassette, and at the back end, I put this $100 bill. It's the kind of ingenuity that I had to come up with, okay? I still had only $210, and my budget was, like I said, uh, $450. My father had business friends in Paris. He used to travel on international business in those days. So my father, said, you know, I will try and save some money. But he actually left $200 for me with a business contact in Paris. The moment I arrived in Paris, I rang up this gentleman and he said, ah, I was waiting for your call. I have a gift for you from your father. So I went, all for $200, you know. He had to travel some high level contact to, to give me to That's how I managed. And when I, on my way back, I ran out of money in Tehran. And again, the same thing. Of, that was the, those were the days of the oil boom. There were lots of Indians working in Iran, building storage tanks and working in refineries. Uh, 
a classmate of mine from Delhi School of Economics. Her father was part of that oil boom. I rung them up at 7 in the morning and said, I'm completely broke. I landed up at their doorstep and they gave me enough money for the rest of my journey back from there on. So that's how, you know, that's how we managed.